made it her life mission uh, to change the landscape for the gastric cancer patient and their families. They actually have very, very high rates of gastric cancer. She was, uh, you know, struggling a lot with her treatments towards the end of her journey to um, kind of infiltrate communities and let people know about the work that we're doing. Our, our volunteers and board members and uh, researchers that are doing great work Debbie, in many ways, was a role model for me. You know, there, there's still a lot to be done in terms of research in the gastric cancer space. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Onco Daily. And today, our guest is a great person, a wonderful woman leader, Andrea Paolo Edelman the Chief Executive Officer of Debbie Stream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. Edelman brings a lifelong commitment to advocating for those in need and has been actively involved in the South Florida community, serving on boards and co co committees of various local medical charities. A lawyer with a degree from St. Thomas University, Edelman spent most of her legal career relentlessly advocating for the rights of the underprivileged population, specifically the rights of kids uh, and kids in need of legal representation due to abandonment, abuse, or neglect by biological parents. Uh, Andrea's non-professional life has also been committed to advocating for those in need. She has been served on the board of the American Lung Association and Bella's Kinship Group, she was a dedicated DDF volunteer prior to becoming its executive director. She was born in Buenos Aires in Argentina. Uh, she grew up in Miami, Florida, and is a graduate of the University of Miami. She is married to Dr. Frank Edelman, and they reside in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, with their cat, Toby. Uh, I mean, her bio is certainly much larger, but I mean, it's going to take longer time for us to, to do it. So I'll leave it to her and to our discussion. Andrea, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. This is a, a great uh, opportunity for us to shed a light um, on Debbie's Dream Foundation and all the exciting work that we're doing for both our patient and caregiver community internationally. Andrea, thank you very much again for being with us. And please, could you tell um, a bit more about Debbie Stream Foundation? And I mean, how do you, did you get involved and then became the CEO of this important uh, foundation sure. and this important work? So Debbie's Dream Foundation was founded by a woman named Debbie Zellman. And in 2000, and eight, she was diagnosed with stage four incurable stomach cancer. Um, she was 40 years old, a mother of three children, had no risk factors, um, and uh, was told basically that she had weeks to live. When Debbie was diagnosed, she realized that there were so few options, uh, you know, available in terms of treatments and resources for the stomach cancer community that she made it her life mission uh, to change the landscape for the gastric cancer patient and their families. So Debbie uh, started responding pretty favorably to her initial treatments. And in 2009, uh, started Debbie's Dream Foundation. The mission of the organization is to raise awareness about gastric cancer, fund research, and provide support to patients and caregivers and their families internationally. Uh, Debbie remained um, as the uh, founder and president um, until 2017. Um, in 2017, unfortunately, Debbie uh, passed away in December. Shortly before Debbie passed away, um, she was uh, you know, struggling a lot with her treatments um, towards the end of her journey. And the board of directors decided that it was um, time to hire somebody uh, to take uh, over the operations of the organization. And I had been uh, a dedicated volunteer with Debbie's Dream Foundation, serving on various uh, committees, and was aware of, of Debbie and her struggles and was very much enamored with, with the work that was being done at the foundation. 
Um, I'm also an attorney by profession, as was Debbie. So we had a lot of common friends. I had um, known many members of her board of directors. And for me, it was a natural step as I was uh, working at Legal Aid of Broward and I was, um, you know, which is another local nonprofit. Um, and I had dedicated my career, my legal career to helping those in need. So it just seemed like a natural transition for me to um, apply for the opportunity to help those in need, which are those that are struggling with gastric cancer, and kind of use my expertise, both legally and both in the nonprofit space, to uh, make an impact uh, with Debbie's dream and continue Debbie's legacy, which has uh, been a very important um, thing for, for the foundation to do since her passing. Thank you very much, really, for the this important work you are, what you are doing. Uh, let's go more into the into the organization and like sure. into the mission of uh, Debbie Stream Foundation and what currently are doing, and what have you accomplished during this time. So um, this year has been um, really a, a pivotal year, I, I think, for Debbie's Dream in terms of um, our expansion. Uh, we are proud to say that we have expanded and now have a DDF affiliate in Japan. We are very excited about uh, this affiliate. Uh, the name of the affiliate is Kabuno Kai, and they've been based out of uh, the, the Japan and working in the Asian region for quite some time. The reason why this is important to the organization is because gastric cancer is one of the cancers that is disproportionately um, seen and affected uh, by certain populations, one of which is in Asia. Um, they actually have very, very high rates of gastric cancer. But contrary to the patients and caregivers that we tend to work with here, uh, most of our patients are stage four. So um, we are excited to be able to learn um, from those different uh, opportunities that we will have um, and be able to also provide services uh, through Debbie Stream Foundation to those communities as well that are affected. Uh, I mean, uh, congratulations with your expansion, but mm -hmm. I mean, how big is the organization now? I know, I mean, you have like chapters all over the United States, but also, I mean, you have other chapters internationally, right? Yeah, we have mission ambassadors. We um, actually changed um, a little bit our branding this year as well, and we're calling them mission ambassadors. We do have mission ambassadors that are located throughout the United States and different regions that will go out um, and kind of do some um, outreach and groundwork for the organization where needed and, and appropriate, getting our resources out, which is very important to us, uh, so people can connect with the organization. We have a lot of um, interesting programs that we do offer our patient community. So those are critical vehicles that we use, our mission ambassadors, uh, to um, kind of infiltrate communities and let people know about the work that we're doing. Uh, so basically, uh, I mean, uh, this volunteers, uh, I mean, fr from where, uh, from which discipline they are coming? Are, are they doctors, nurses, medical professionals, or, or sure. patients, patient advocates? I mean, how do you choose your ambassadors? And if someone is like right now watching us and they want to, join Debbie's Dream Foundation, I mean, what background should they have? What's the requirements and what sh should they do? I mean. Right, well, thank you for that. Uh, so um, being a nonprofit, so being a nonprofit, we always need help um, in any way that we can um, accomplish that. Our resources are limited. Uh, we, we want to, um, use the money uh, that is donated to the foundation in the best possible way possible, which is um, one of our you know, main uh, vehicles to do that and to serve the, our, our patient community is to fund research. But in terms of our volunteers, we have volunteers from all walks of life. We have patient volunteers that um, 
you know, help with our advocacy efforts and they are on committees for the planning of our big February event that we can discuss um, later on in the interview. But um, we have a lot of, we have board members that are patients and are retired. We have a lot of medical advisory board members that are doctors in the space and they help with our programming, um, serving uh, as speakers on different webinars, um, symposia that we host throughout the country. Um, we have volunteers that simply will go out in their communities and give out um, our packets um, and host a booth at a health fair. So everyone is welcome, I, I, I guess, uh, as long as you want to help the organization, uh, we can always find a place for you. Uh, we're growing, so we need help, as much help as, as possible. So that's uh, kind of how, how our mission works, uh, through, through everybody that wants to help and can offer whatever expertise uh, that may be. Very nice. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people will see it. now you're like this challenge and uh, <laughs> many people would like to join the important work you are doing. I mean, talking about the priorities, what are your 2024 priorities? What do you want to accomplish this year? Yeah, so um, we just got back from um, ESMO GI, and um, we were excited uh, to attend that conference. That was a conference that was held in Munich, Germany, and um, we're actually going to be hosting our ASCO and uh, ESMO updates webinar for those uh, that are interested um, next Monday, July 22nd um, at 3 p.m., so I believe that's Eastern time. And um, we um, are also working on a large celebratory event that's going to be hosted on November 9th um, here in South Florida. I believe many of, of the watchers or you would uh, be aware of the uh, Seminole Hardware Casino. Um, it's a beautiful guitar building that last year we lit up also in November on November 30th in honor of curing, curing stomach cancer. Um, November is our month. Uh, periwinkle is our color. So last year we partnered with My Gut Feeling out of Canada and a lot of different sister stomach cancer organizations and lit up over 180 worldwide monuments to raise awareness about gastric cancer. So this year we're going to have um, our celebratory dinner where we're going to highlight a lot of the luminaries in the gastric cancer space, our, our volunteers and board members and uh, researchers that are doing great work um, in the space will be honored at this dinner. And we're very much looking forward to lighting up the guitar and um, hosting our Illuminations celebratory dinner on November 9th. Also, um, that day, we're going to have a um, educational patient and caregiver conference where patients and caregivers will be able to interact with doctors, some of the top doctors in the field, ask questions, learn about the latest in research, clinical trials, um, immunotherapies, biomarkers, nutrition, and all the topics that are really top of mind and interesting to the gastric cancer community. I mean, it sounds very nice. Thank you. Uh, We're excited. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you are going to have a wonderful event. And um, what about the, I mean, any other plans? I know you are doing some, uh, I mean, an important advocacy event in 2025. And I mean, can you explore a bit more about it? Yeah, so um as I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the uh, things that Debbie, our founder, really, really wanted the foundation to do was to fund research. And we have continued to do that um, since 2014. Uh, we've been funding research through the AACR uh, through our own fundraising efforts. But we've also been uh, very much taking the lead um, on the federal level because we realize that the money that we can raise will not make the biggest impact uh, for stomach cancer research, but the federal money that is available uh, will. So we've been uh, growing um, an event uh, each and every year that happens in February, where we advocate um, to be included as one of the cancers that's eligible to receive funding through the PRCRP program, which is the peer-reviewed cancer research program. 
And um, that program uh, will allow funding for specifically for stomach cancer. And we've been advocating each and every year to make sure that we're included to be able to receive those funds. As many of our of the researchers out there will know that that's money that they can apply for uh, to utilize for those grants, as well as the funding through the AACR. So um, we were last year we had 150 participants um, in our February event. And this year, this coming year, we will have, you know, we 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 will want more advocates uh, coming to the Hill and helping us raise um, awareness for gastric cancer and to make sure that we get that funding. It's very, very important uh, to find a cure, which is our ultimate mission. Very nice. Thanks again. And I, I wanna go for some more questions about yourself. You are an accomplished woman leader, I mean, Thank you have you. done a lot and still you are doing a lot and I'm sure you are going to accomplish great, great things in the future. But what's the key to your success? Well, I think that, um, you know, pivoting very quickly. Um, I know when I, um, you know, started working at the foundation, there were a lot of changes, obviously, uh, the transition you know, losing our founder. Um, I think um, it's the pivoting has allowed the organization to become a lot more patient focused, which is really, really important. So I'm glad that I was able to see that process through um, to make sure that the organization thrived and survived as it has, while still keeping in mind, you know, the focus points of the organization. Um, so I think that Pivoting, um, being a versatile um, are traits that are important to me personally and have helped me in my role um, here at Debbie's Dream Foundation. From from your uh, bio, it's very clear, you, I mean, your passion towards helping people in need, right? I mean, you were uh, an advocate for the kids, uh, both professionally and in the non-professional field, and then you came to the uh, yeah. to the gastric cancer. Um, and what was the? I mean, what's the reason to choose that? Like, yeah. uh, I think quite difficult field. It is actually a really, really difficult field, and I don't think we mentioned. But prior uh, to being an attorney, um, I do have uh, a bachelor's in psychology and sociology. And um, during my earlier career um, where I explored uh, working in that field, I did work with HIV patients providing um, a lot of services and mental health uh, services. And I've always been, and then the children that were in crisis being abused, abandoned, or neglected. And here, primarily stage four patients that are diagnosed and from one minute to the next, they're in crisis, their lives are completely turned upside down, which is what we see here every day. They're facing a horrible diagnosis with, you know, it affects each, each and every aspect of their lives, financial, caregiving, work, what they look like, right? Um, so many factors. So I think I've always done well um, in these types of situations. Um, I love helping people when they possibly believe that there is no help otherwise. So I think that that really brings out the best um, in my leadership. And um, I think that the stage four, you know, a lot of the community that we serve really, really has a lot of needs that need to be met. So we do that through through the work that we do each and every day. How you balance the work, uh, work and the life? <laughs> Well, you know, I think that we actually transitioned to working remotely uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we saw that it, it was beneficial for a lot of the things that we do, and we were able to, um, to transition pretty quickly to the remote environment. So I think that what I try to do each and every day that's important for me is taking care of myself, because if I don't do that, I cannot be good for anyone else, right? And um, like we said, this this job does take a lot. We we lose people, and that's really really hard for myself. Our mentors that work directly with our patient community, our staff, 
um, it's very, very difficult to, to navigate that and, and still stay positive for our patients. So I believe in taking care of myself um, as well um, so that I can be the best uh, leader. So each and every day I try to exercise um, is very important to me. Yoga um, is something that I try to do um, some, something each and every day. And also ice skating. I, I do skate um, and have been skating for many years. And that's also something that I try to do every day in the morning or in the evening and particularly on the weekends to kind of, you know, connect myself to 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 relax and to feel better. <laughs> and you like to travel, right? Yes, yes. I love to travel for both business and pleasure. The foundation did some work through our international expansion. We did um, a few conferences in Korea. Um, and we also, you know, worked with the IGCC in Japan, the International uh, Gastric Cancer Congress. We were part of a patient advocacy session. As I said, we just came back from ESMO GI. And we try to attend a lot of the different conferences that are relevant in our space throughout the year. So yeah, my 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 calendar is very, very busy <laughs> with all these events and uh, try to get in a little bit of personal travel as well. What's the top destination for you? <laughs> well, for me personally, I would love to go to Prague, Vienna and Budapest. That's been on my list for a long time, but I've not made it out there just because it's, you know, it's, it's just difficult with, with my travel schedule and my husband's and all of our obligations, but hopefully maybe in 2025, uh, I will be able to, to do that on a personal level, not, not for business. <laughs> uh, so who is our old model for you? So, um, you know, I, I will say that Debbie, in many ways, was a role model for me, uh, especially, you know, keeping in mind, you know, how sick she was towards the end and what she went through and, you know, actually what she went through for nine and a half years, uh, undergoing harsh treatments, you know, giving selflessly of herself to others to really start an organization to make an impact uh, for those that you know, need help, uh, that that need to be acknowledged, that need to, not only that, but, you know, there, there's still a lot to be done in terms of research in the gastric cancer space. So I think that Debbie is definitely a role model for me, her tenacity um, and her, you know, drive to, to do and to make an impact and things that were important to her personally, no matter what her circumstances. I know also you would like to watch movies. What are your top three recommendations? Well, I, I just happened to watch a movie on the plane. Um, I saw Oppenheimer uh, for the first time. Uh, I know it's been out for a while. I'm a little behind, but uh, traveling to Germany, I was able to watch uh, that movie. So I would highly recommend that in terms of, you know, I don't really go to the movies too much, but I try to watch things on Netflix and, uh, and so forth. And another show that I'm watching on Netflix, it's not a movie, but I highly recommend is called Secession. So I don't know if, if you're aware of it, but yeah. definitely a favorite of mine. <laughs> okay, wonderful. And the last question, who we should uh, interview next? Um, well, I I personally think that um, one of the things that I would like uh, that you know to highlight about the foundation and some of our recent work is the um, fellowship that we started at MSK. So we started uh, this year in addition to our um, advocacy that we discussed, um, some of our grants, you know, and some of the money that the board has has put aside is for um, young researchers and young investigators to encourage them to get into gastric cancer. And they prioritized this year to give money to MSK for a new fellowship for three years. So I know that Dr. Janjigian, Yelena Janjigian on our medical advisory board is um, spearheading that program 
And um, I think that she would be a great person to interview. Um, she is so dynamic and doing so much work internationally. This is very important to Debbie's dream and um, and the work that she's doing um, with with the fellowship and, and the fellow, I think would be interesting to, um, to have Dr. Jenjigian speak about all the work that she's doing. <laughs> Thank you so much. I will certainly do it. She's a very dear friend and it would be a great pleasure to interview her. Yes, Thank you so much. Wonderful. Is there anything else you would like to share before we close? Yeah, um, one of the things that I think is important about one of the things that the foundation is currently working on, um, and I think the doctors and a lot of the people that are listening to this will appreciate is um, we're trying to do a lot, of, a lot of education with our patient community on biomarkers. It's a complicated topic. It's difficult to understand. So, you know, we've been trying to educate patients about the importance of having their biomarkers checked uh, for many years, but this year we've taken things a little bit further in that regard, and we've launched um, an animated video to explain to patients what are the biomarkers in a very simple way, who should get tested, why is it important, and we also uh, utilized um, Dr. Sam Kleppner from Massachusetts General, and he's doing um, we're launching a video with him that's going to be um, in conjunction with the animated uh, for a, a physician to speak briefly uh, in a very simple way uh, and, and educate the patient community about the biomarkers and their importance. So that's going to be launching in the next week or two. So um, we want to make sure that people know about that resource and if doctors would like to use this resource or also get it out to their communities, I think it would be helpful um, as well. Uh, please don't forget to share it with us and we'll be happy to highlight it also on the Onco Daily and uh, to share it throughout our channels. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, we're trying to make things as simple as possible for our patient community to understand. And we put a lot of thought and time into uh, making sure that patients understand uh, these uh, complicated topics and that they can use them uh, to uh, have dialogues with their physicians and get on the best treatment options uh, available for them. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thanks a lot for the very insightful uh, interview and I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having us. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.